before we have studied uh, Laplace transform and its implications uh, and then we have also studied time domain analysis for first and second order systems, uh, the effect of uh, poles, zeros and all things. Now, in this lecture we will primarily uh, see some stability behavior of the linear systems and can we analyze the stability behavior through transfer function, that is uh, one of our objectives of this class. Followed by, we will also st study the steady state error characteristics uh, of uh, linear systems. <coughs> and we are still here in, uh, in the classical control overview, we, uh, after we are done, uh, we will go to the modern control anyway. So, first is uh, stability analysis through transfer function. Uh, so, stability primarily we know that uh, if some object is turning like this, okay, this is stable and if the inverted sort of thing, it is unstable and this is uh, neutral. So, uh, in any small amount of uh, disturbance can make the system go out of this equilibrium point and all these three are uh, essentially standing on their equilibrium point essentially, but this is a stable equilibrium, this is an unstable equilibrium somewhere in, in, in between there is a neutral stability, it will keep on staying like that actually. Okay. So, that is a conceptual description of, st of stability actually. Now, as far as the response is concerned, the response can be of uh, various nature. Suppose, we give a constant input, just a step input starting at uh, time 0, then uh, if the system is stable, it can oscillate around that uh, input and uh, stabilize and it can also go one sided and approach to that uh, input, this is also stable. Okay. And uh, this, this kind of behavior what you see here goes, the response goes unbounded that is unstable and the response can also grow unbounded uh, in a sinusoidal way that is also unstable. If it remains I mean marginally stable, it will keep on oscillating around that value forever, okay. that is the concept. Now, as far as uh, uh, the stability behavior with respect to the you know, pole locations are concerned, uh, we can picturally depict something like this. The poles uh, can come out anywhere I mean in this uh, <coughs> I mean this uh, S plane. And if we plot these uh, uh, poles, let us say the poles can be on the 0, I mean at, at 0, it can travel along the real axis both, posit both positive side as well as negative side, it can travel along the imaginary axis, it can also travel anywhere anywhere else actually. So, suppose uh, uh, it, it is anywhere in the right hand uh, right half plane, okay, it turns out that the system is unstable, we will study little more uh, as we go along. Uh, and if it is uh, if it is in the negative half, it turns out to be stable. However, if it is in the negative half, if it uh, travels along the real line, there will not be any oscillatory component. Okay. So, it will and as it uh, goes away and away, the response uh, becomes I mean starts with a slower decay to a faster decay. Okay. If it wants the pole locations go away and away to the left hand side. Similarly, the pole locations go away and away in the right half side, it, uh, the, uh, the response grows very fast actually. So, initially it will, I mean if the pole location is here, the response starts growing some suppose like this, then the pole location is here, it will it will travel even faster. Along the imaginary axis, uh, uh, the response is uh, marginally stable. However, if the location is here, it will continue to oscillate with a lesser frequency. If it is goes away and away, the frequency of oscillation will be more. Okay. And similarly, if it uh, goes uh, away radially sort of thing, the frequency I mean uh, the, the oscillation curve is, uh, is growing basically, it will keep on growing that way. And similarly, in the, in the other side of the story, I mean the other side of the plane, left, left hand side, uh, it will be both oscillatory, but decaying if it, if it goes in the left half side sort of thing. So, es essentially this is an observation that if the pole locations are, uh, are placed in a variety of uh, ways then this is what the response turns out to be. So, can we study all those? So, that that gives us an indication that uh, the pole location plays a major role in stability analysis. And uh, coming coming to a little bit formal study, we already seen that uh, the total response of a system is nothing but the sum of the transient and steady state responses. Okay. So, this is the total response, it is the transient part of it and the steady state part of it. And the transient response is the response uh, that goes from an initial state to the final state as t evolves, this is the part actually. Okay. And steady state response is the response as t goes to infinity, eventually it will start with something okay, and then it will approach the steady state response if the system is stable, the transient part is supposed to decay actually. So, that is uh, that is how the response of the system uh, is all about. 
So, stability definition these are formal definitions uh, a system is uh, said to be stable if the natural response approaches 0 as time approaches infinity okay. and the system is unstable if the natural response approaches to infinity as time approaches infinity. That means both the stable and unstable behavior as, as well as marginal stability the system is marginally stable if the natural response neither decays nor grows that is what we just saw in the previous slide but remains constant or oscillates within a bound. This is uh, what we saw it oscillates within a bound here because the pole was somewhere here and it can also remain constant actually these are all marginal stability behavior ok. This is also a marginal stability. So, the, these are uh, the like formal definition coming from natural response of the system. Remember the, the, uh, the response is transient uh, and steady state part of it and uh, <coughs> primarily the, the natural response corresponds to this uh, this transient part of it actually. Okay. So, anyway so this is this is the stability definition formally and uh, another definition which comes from something called bounded input bounded output that means if the syst a system is said to be stable if every bounded input yields a bounded output that means uh, the if you excite the system in a bounded input sense the input itself should not grow to infinity. So, it is so it is it can oscillate it can stay constant whatever but it should be bounded then the response also remains bounded need not be with the, within the same bound the, the response bound can be even larger than the input bound that is still ok as long as it does not go to infinity sort of thing. If system is unstable if any bounded input results in an unbounded output if you have just one bounded input okay, which will result in an unbounded output then the system is uh, unstable otherwise for every bounded input the system response has to be bounded. So, that these are, these are like actually this behavior stability plays a major uh, imp rather important role in nonlinear systems okay, because no sense of stability will differ there. However, for linear systems both notions of stability are equivalent actually if one is stable in one sense the it is also stable in the other sense. So, that is where it is. So, stability analysis from closed loop transfer function suppose somebody gives us a transfer function of a closed loop system then how do you analyze whether the system remains stable or not actually and we have already seen some of the characteristic plots uh, in, in the previous slide. So, stable systems have closed loop transfer functions with poles only in the left half plane okay. and unstable systems have closed loop transfer uh, transfer functions with at least one pole okay. if at least one pole is in the right half plane or and or are poles of multiplicity greater than one that means it uh, either one pole in the pure right half plane or number of poles uh, exactly at the same location on the imaginary axis ok. So, that, that can also lead to instability and marginally stable systems have closed loop transfer functions with only one imaginary axis poles of multiplicity 1 and poles and the remaining poles should be in the left half plane actually ok. So, that is uh, that is uh, the analysis result sort of thing. And it interestingly turns out that uh, if even if you have a same system ok. So, the open loop system remains same however, uh, something called DC gain that is the number in the numerator ok. As the gain uh, increases 3 to 7 suddenly then uh, the stable behavior ok what you see here ok becomes somewhat unstable here ok. This is the stable becomes unstable because of the increase of the gains. Okay. So, this is essentially you can think of it as a, a it is coming from some sort of a controller gain then you have to be careful about that actually a control gain cannot be very high it will result in instability sort of thing. Okay. Why does it happen because if you see the uh, if you see the closed loop transfer function this is uh, like uh, g, s, g of s divided by 1 plus uh, g s h s sort of thing that uh, c s by r s that all details we have uh, not covered because it is a review class anyway. So, c s by r s uh, in other words if you just uh, talk about uh, that a little ok. So, it turns out that c of s by r of s is actually g of s divided by 1 plus g s h s assuming it is a negative feedback uh, ok in negative uh, feedback here what you what you see here is is a negative sign here actually ok. So, that is that is what and h, h of s is actually is 1 because it is a unity feedback system otherwise you will have 
you will have a h of s sitting here in the in the feedback path okay h of s will be coming here actually okay so that is actually one here so what you what you essentially have is g of s divided by 1 1 plus g of s okay so if you do the computation that way and then then the numerator numerator will turn out something and denominator will turn out something and this denominator what you have here okay is essentially which will what we are talking here actually okay the poles that you see here these uh, these pole locations okay are essentially the pole locations of this transfer function what you see here so so the the gain value does play a role in locating the closed loop uh, poles actually okay. so i mean the, so then uh, the natural curiosity turns out that uh, without uh, having a solution that uh, without actually solving for that uh, c of uh, s to time domain can we infer something about the stability of this closed loop system really okay knowing that the closed loop transfer function see this is this is the transfer function that we will assume that uh, this this is something called t of s okay assuming t of s closed loop transfer known to transfer function known to us can we infer stability directly actually okay so this essentially leads us to a topic uh, in classical control uh, called as ruth hervey's approach for stability analysis the very standard approach uh, we will see that in a nutshell okay so, then uh, the there are some sufficient conditions uh, if you if if you put the sufficient conditions in perspective then the system is unstable okay uh, i mean a system is uh, unstable if all the signs of coefficients of the denominator of the closed loop transfer functions are not same that means you have a transfer function uh, which is uh, let us say you, you are talking about a transfer function n s by d s okay this is our transfer function that you are talking t of s okay so this d of s what you are looking at okay this particular this particular denominator thing if this d of s d of s is essentially a polynomial in in laplace variable s n of s is also a polynomial so if this polynomial d of s and the signs of its coefficients okay are are not same that means either all of them have to be positive or all of them have to be negative okay if there is some sign change somewhere like let's so for example s to the power 5 plus 4s 4th minus 3s q sort of thing then there is a change of sign basically so in those if it happens then you don't really need to do further analysis you can directly say that the system is unstable okay number one number two if the powers of s suppose it is a fifth order polynomial then all powers of s the s to the power 5 plus some s to the power 4 some coefficient and things like that all of them should exist actually okay if something is missing suppose, suppose for example s to the power 5 is there 4 is there then suddenly square is there and 1 is there so essentially you are missing some q term actually that means the coefficient of that is, is, is zero essentially in those situations uh, the system is either unstable okay or at the best it can be marginally stable it can never be stable okay those analysis uh, are uh, these are all sufficient conditions they are not necessary by the way okay now it leads us to the question because these are uh, not necessary it leads us to the question that uh, what if all coefficients are positive and no power of s is missing suppose it, uh, if all are negative then it is also equivalent to having all all of them are positive because minus of that you can take common and make it zero essentially you are making it equal to zero to find the roots so if all of them are negative it is equivalent of saying that all of them are positive as well actually okay so uh, with that condition with that in mind uh, we will we'll analyze this particular case that if the all the coefficients do exist okay and uh, all of them are are positive basically so the, this is where the critical condition arises and this is where the root thorvis criterion uh, plays a important role so these are the two famous uh, mathematicians uh, you can say them say that one was uh, english uh, mathematician uh, roth and another one is german okay and he is actually born in german but uh, last part of his life spent in zurich which is in uh, switzerland actually so these two are pioneers pioneers in this uh, this particular thing they, they have actually proposed that this uh, what we are going to study here 
So, before you study the criterion in detail, there is a caution, okay. this particular method tells, it only tells how many closed loop system poles are in the left half plane, in the right half plane and on the j omega axis. It only tells how many poles are there in left half side, right half side on the j omega is something like that actually. Okay. It, it never tells where those poles are located. Okay. It just tells this many for two poles are on the right half side, three poles on left half side, one pole is imaginary axis. I mean that kind of uh, that kind of things it will uh, it will tell actually. But that is sufficient for stability analysis. We can very clearly tell the system is stable or unstable. Okay. So that that becomes a sufficient information for that actually. So what's the methodology? The methodology consists of two parts. One is construct a rock table, and then interpret the rock table actually. Okay. So we will see how to construct a rock table and then we will see how to interpret the rock table actually. Interpretation is fairly rather fairly easy and only you have to look at only the first column of the table ultimately and tell the uh, and observe the sign of the entries of the first column that is all. Okay. And if there is no sign change then you are done, if there is sign change then the system is uh, unstable sort of thing, we will see that actually. Okay. So you construct a table, you look at the first column. And the first column, all that you do not have to even see the numbers, you have to see only the signs actually, okay, whether that is positive or negative sort of thing. And you see the, if all of them are positive, all of them are negative, that then also the system remains stable. You have to only see the number of uh, sign changes actually, that, that comes into picture. Okay. So, here is the here is the detail, I mean uh, suppose this is our closed loop transfer function, this is the commanded output and this is reference input sort of thing. So, this is uh, that N s numerator polynomial divided by denominator polynomial D of s and D of s plays a role here. So, we are expanding that, uh, let us say the D of s is a fourth order polynomial in this form. Okay. So, what is this, uh, you, you st where do you start with? You construct a table like that, you start with the highest power, then the next one, then the next one, then the next one until s to the power 0, that means uh, it is just one sort of thing. Okay. Now, first two columns, uh, I mean first two rows, you just fill it up by looking at this polynomial. Okay. So, s to the power 4, so you first start with this coefficient a 4, so put it here, okay. then go to the alternative sense actually, you skip this, this will come to the next column anyway, I mean next row. So, first you start with a 4, put it, put it here, okay. then skip that one, next is a 2, put it here, okay. skip that one, next is a 0, put it here. Okay, so, that will let that will essentially complete the first uh, first row. Then you go to the next row and the next highest power alternatively again. So, s cube there is a coefficient a 3 put it here, okay. then skip this one, the next one is a 1 put it here and then uh, then there is nothing so that is 0. Okay. So, this is how you construct the first two rows actually. Okay. Then you forward the other rows, then the you carry out the uh, algebra. Uh, so, this algebra is uh, given fairly uh, standard basically like uh, using these entries out here, you can fill up all the entries that way, this is a standard thing actually. So, this is negative of this determinant divided by a 3, this pi out element sort of thing and this is uh, you construct these two I mean entries a, a 4, a 3 here and then the next column a 0 is and 0 here, okay, put it there and the next one is nothing there. So, that will automatically become 0, 0 and that, uh, that entry is 0. So, okay. So, you construct all this like this, this using this formula and you will essentially come up with numbers b1, c1, d1 here, b2 here, then it, these, these entries will turn out to be 0 in this case actually. Okay. So, now you are, uh, you have constructed this, uh, this root table. So, now you have to, you have to interpret that, but before that also note that any row of the root table can be multiplied by a positive constant. That means, sometimes if, it, if it this entry turns out to be let us say 5, 10 and 15, then essentially you can you can rewrite that using 1, 2 and 3, cancel that 5 factor. Okay. So, that is essentially, uh, that essentially helps us in uh, in simplified, simplified algebra basically. Okay. And you can do that as many times as, as possible, I mean you want to do it, uh, provided that the constant that you are dividing or multiplying is a positive constant, remember that, it cannot be negative constant actually. So, now, now that you have constructed this table, the what the condition? The condition tells the, the number of roots in the polynomial that are in the right half plane okay, is equal to the number of sign changes in the first column. Okay. So, we have constructed the first column. 
I mean, we constructed the root table. We just see the first column here, okay? And we we come back to this question and we interpret this this way, this table, so that the number of roots of the polynomial that are in the right half plane. Remember, only one root in the right half plane is system, system is unstable. Okay. So if there is only one sign change, then then system is uh, anyway unstable. Okay. Okay. But it tells little more than that. Tells the number of roots of the polynomial that are in the right half plane is equal to the number of sign changes in the first column. Okay. And if there is no sign changes in the first column, that means the system is stable. Okay. So that's the that's the condition that it turns out. Further analysis and all you can see a classical control book, and all this material for this particular lecture, everything is taken from Norman Nice actually. Okay. So you can see all more details in that uh, that book also. Now going to an example very quickly. Uh, this let's start with some sort of an example third order polynomial. Okay. So a uh, first step is to do this uh, this closed loop transfer function starting from this open loop transfer function actually. Okay. So, I mean again that uh, that uh, formula is something like this T of s so is uh, this remember this is a negative feedback. So, it will be something like uh, assuming that this is G of s, h of s is 1. Okay. So, you will have this formula G of s divided by 1 plus G of s. If you carry out this uh, and instead of G of s you, you plug in this one, okay, this, this particular transfer function and then it will turn out to be something like this actually. So, now you are ready with a closed loop transfer function. So, essentially we are more bothered about the denominator. So, we will see the denominator here and then we will construct it the, this root table actually. F first of all before even if you before constructing the root table observe that uh, none of the powers of s are missing here. That means all the powers of s, s q, s square, s and uh, s to the power 0 all are there. Okay. And all of these coefficients have the same sign. Okay, these are all positive anyway. So, we cannot directly invoke the sufficient condition until the system is unstable, but whether the system is stable or not we still do not know. Okay, so, because of that we have to go to the Roth table and, and infer from there actually. All right, so, constructing the Roth table, say first you start with S cube and then S, that is the first row okay. and then the S square and uh, 0 that is the second row. Okay, anyway, these columns are 0, 0, so there is nothing there after that. Okay, S cube and 31 will come here and 10 and this 10, 30 will come here. Remember this 10 and 10, 30, I mean 1030 is actually a multiple of 10, so I can cancel by 10, 10 is a positive number. So, I will essentially have 1 and 103, this will simplify my, my algebra little more actually. Okay. And then uh, I'll con construct the root table. I mean, go ahead and construct the root table for rest of the two rows, and then ultimately see that here is a sign change actually. Okay, so it's a positive to negative, and then negative to positive again. Okay, there are two sign changes here actually. Okay, so and hence the system is unstable, obviously, and not only unstable, it has two poles in the right half plane. Okay, and you can very very quickly verify this. Okay, using the root uh, function of uh, MATLAB. Somebody, I mean, somebody, I mean, I, I assume all of you are comfortable with MATLAB. So there are uh, there is a function called roots, and if you if you use that, actually, I think uh, that is the function something like this MATLAB roots. Okay, and then this is the polynomial that you have to give something one, then ten, then thirty one, and then one zero three zero. If you if you do this. Okay, with the, these brackets and all that and put in enter, then it will tell you the roots actually of, a, of any order polynomial by the way. So, uh, you have to keep on giving the coefficients of that polynomial in descending order and then it will find out the roots actually. You can verify that the two roots will be in the right half side of this particular polynomial. Okay. And right. Now, there are special cases. Okay. These are all regular cases what happened so far. So, this is something called basic root table also. Now, special cases arise uh, in one of the following cases. One is uh, something sometimes it may so happen that there is a 0 in the first column of a row. Remember that when you construct the row table, okay, you are always dividing some by a 3 here, then b 1 here, then c 1 here. Okay. So, if any of these, these entries turns out to be 0, then there is a problem. Okay. Number 1. Number 2, it can also so happen that all these entries of a row can also turn out to be 0 in some special cases actually. Okay. 
then you are stuck there. You cannot construct in this regular manner actually. Okay. So how do you do, how do you handle those issues basically? Okay. So first case, uh, you can uh, uh, I mean if, if it turns out that there is a zero in the first column, that we consider that as a case number one. Okay. This is a zero in the first column. Then we'll consider the entire row consisting of zero. Okay. These cases need further analysis, and I'm just going to tell you the results actually. Okay. So if the first case, if zero happens in the first column, there are two ways of handling this. One way is to replace that zero wherever zero exists by a by a number epsilon. Carry out the algebra with respect to epsilon. Then analyze the uh, the sign things and all in a limiting sense. And in, in the sense that you allow uh, epsilon to tend to 0 either from left or from right actually. Okay. So, I mean either uh, epsilon tends to 0 plus or 0 minus in those in that particular limiting case what happens actually. Okay. So, that is one way of handling that. Another case is uh, uh, this is observation is something like that like something like this. See if there is a pole location somewhere in the plane. If I just take one by that particular number, okay, then uh, the the sign of that particular number remains in the same side, same side actually. That means if there is a positive pole, okay, let's say s equal to some two plus three j sort of thing, and I just take a reciprocal of that, okay, one by s sort of thing, actually, then it will be a different number. Okay, however, the it will not travel from left side of the plane to right side or vice versa. It will remain on the same side actually. Okay. So, exploiting that what you can do is you can replace s by 1 over d, okay. then it will result in a polynomial in the uh, in d essentially yes. and that means it will have a polynomial in the reverse order basically like suppose s to the power n is there that will turn out to be 1, 1 by d to the power whole n basically. So, s to the power uh, suppose it is uh, I mean I, I okay. so, uh, there is no example here because of uh, time restrictions probably, but then I will just give a simple example. See suppose you have uh, something like s square plus uh, let us say 3 s plus 2 actually that is the polynomial. Then I replace that by 1 by d square plus 3 1 by d plus 2. Okay. Okay. So, this will result in something like uh, 1 okay. I mean 1 by d square plus 3 by d plus uh, 2. Okay and it will result in something like 1 plus 3 d plus 2 d square. Okay. So, that means, the, if you just interpret this polynomial, it will it will take the reverse order, it will d square, this is essentially 2 d square plus 3 d plus 1 essentially. So, that means, the, this 2 has become come here and then 3 has come here and this 1 has come here. The polynomial results in a reverse order actually. So, that reverse order polynomial need not have uh, need not result in a first column being 0 actually first column entry. Okay. So, these are the two tricks that you can play one thing is uh, you replace that uh, uh, 0 by a small value epsilon carry out the algebra and ultimately see what is if, I mean when you take epsilon 10 to 0 and all that that is one way of looking at and the other one is uh, reverse the polynomial and see whether you can avoid this uh, this 0 element in the first uh, column actually. Uh, and uh, method 2 has some computational advantage over the method 1. However, method 2 may or may not work in all cases actually. Okay. When, you reserve, when you reverse the polynomial order, it may still result in a 0 element. So, uh, in that case you do not have any choice other than going to method 1 sort of thing. Number 2 is now special case that what if the entire row consists of uh, zeros actually in some particular case. In that case, what we'll do is uh, form an auxiliary equation from the row above the row of zeros, and then differentiate the polynomial with respect to s, and replace that row of zeros by its coefficients. Actually, okay. So if I go back to this uh, this gen generic uh, table, okay, let's say th this entire column has I mean entire row has become zero here. Okay, that means b1 is also zero, b2 is also zero. What do you do with that? Now, suppose I go back to this row and then just take a differentiation of that, then s q will result in a square term okay. and then uh, s will result in 0 0 third term actually. right? So, if I just take this polynomial that means a 3 times x q uh, s q plus a 1 s basically, then I differentiate that it will turn out to be something like uh, well 
let us do that a little bit. This is something like A 3 S cube okay, plus uh, A 1 S. So, if I just take differentiate d by d s of that, it turns out to be 3 A 3 S square plus A 1. Okay. So, I will take these coefficients in okay, and then carry on with the work actually okay. and that will result in the same analysis essentially. So, instead of 0 0, I can replace that, this one I can replace here, that one I can replace there and then proceed further actually. Okay. So, that is the trick to follow and all these why it happens and all are there in the book, uh, you can uh, see that actually. Okay. So, this is one way of uh, I mean handling this, uh, this special case essentially. There is also uh, some analysis that you can do from uh, roth Thurwis uh, condition okay, for the design. Suppose this k, uh, let us say this is your control loop, I mean this is your closed loop system in unity feedback sense. And this k essentially comes from a block which is you can put that k here and then put it uh, something like 1 here okay, if you want to. Okay. So, this k will essentially cater for this uh, gain things and all that. Uh, so, that is uh, okay, let me erase that. Okay. All right. So, now the question is uh, can we find a range of this gain k? Okay. okay, so that the system to remain stable, unstable, marginally stable, and all that. If you know a range of values k that will result in stable stability of the system, then within that we will it, it, it I mean within that we will be able to select a value for k. That means it, it gives us a tuning range of this gain k basically. Okay. You really do not have to start from minus infinity go up to plus infinity. You know that within these values the system remains stable. So, within that value I will, I will uh, kind of change this gain value and then see what is what results in the best performance actually. Okay. So, that is the motivation here, can we do that? So, this is my g of s, this is my h of s again that is equal to 1 and this is what uh, the system that you want to analyze actually. Okay. So, first thing is closed loop transfer function again and this is again g of s by 1 plus g s h s and it will result in some sort of a polynomial like this. Okay. So, the question is I mean will this system remain stable and it is clearly a function of k because k comes in the denominator. Okay. So, now we will go back to this uh, root uh, table and construct this table. So, first we start with s cube and then that is 1 here and 77 here that comes here. Then there is s square and s 0 that means 18 here and k here. Now, we construct the, the rest of the table. Okay. It turns out that these values are somewhere here. Okay. Now, according to the Roth condition, this the signs of these things should remain same for the system to be stable and these are already positive. So, these two must also remain positive actually. Okay. So, that gives us a condition that k must be greater than 0 right here okay, from the from the fourth entry and uh, how long can you do? Okay. k should be less than this value. right? As long as k is greater than 0 and less than that value, system signs will all remain same and hence we will have stability. Okay. Now, if it is greater than that, obviously there will be sign change here, there are two sign changes uh, uh, rather and hence it will remain unstable actually. Okay. Negative values of case are not allowed, I mean not allowed in the sense if you, if you pick up the system becomes unstable sort of thing and the question is what if it is exactly equal to that value, that means there will be a 0 element here. Okay. Then you go back to that uh, that uh, previous row and then talk about uh, like uh, differentiate this polynomial whatever polynomial you have and put it back there. Okay. Then it result in something similar actually. Okay. So, then it will again turn out the system is stable, but in this particular case further analysis will show that system will remain marginally stable. Okay. So, essentially we would like to avoid this, this particular number in a control design sense, we will be able to vary that. Be, uh, between 0 and this number somewhere actually. Okay. So, this analysis will give us a method of tuning this uh, gain k. Okay. So, that is all about uh, the stability analysis from uh, Ruth Hervey's conditions. Further details are there in the book. Uh, it becomes very handy when you do not have computer power in hand and essentially it can talk about any order polynomial. It does not have to have like second order, third order and all that. You can talk about nth order polynomial. Still you will be very very quickly able to infer whether the system is stable or unstable. And moreover, how many poles are in the left upside, how many poles are right upside, all those information can be derived rather easily from just constructing a table basically. That is the power of this. 
Now, next topic uh, we will uh, uh, in a classical control sense uh, the great deal of interest for steady state error analysis as well actually. Okay. So, if the system remains stable then the next question is uh, what is its performance actually. Okay. So, in that sense uh, we will be able to uh, talk a little bit, little bit about the steady state error essentially. So, the definition steady state error is the difference of uh, difference between the input and the output for a prescribed test input as t goes to infin infinity. Remember the when you talk about input this is the reference input signal it is nothing to do with control input that is one thing that I want to emphasize here because many people think about the difference between the real output and the in the control input but that is not the case. Okay. When you talk about R of s that is the reference input that you want to track actually using a controller. Okay. So, if you if your reference input is something and your actual output of the system is something else e, even when t goes to infinity then there is a finite amount of error sitting there that is called steady state error actually. Okay. Ideally speaking we do not want steady state errors okay. because if we, there, is, there is a reference command we want to track it in a perfect sense that means steady state error is actually 0. Okay. So, that will uh, that will whether that will happen in what condition that will happen and things like that uh, that is all that is that is the analysis that we are going to talk in brief here. Okay. And usual state test inputs that are used for steady state error analysis as well as design we know that these are the step input, ramp input and parabola input and the justification of these essentially comes from Taylor series analysis. Okay. Sometimes we also test the signal using uh, sinusoidal terms and that justification comes from Fourier series. Okay. But most of the time uh, the justific I mean the test signals used are step, ramp and parabola to begin with. Essentially most of the time it is step and ramp. Okay. In some specific case we will talk about parabola as well. Okay. And if you if you are testing the your system with respect to these three inputs that means essentially you are testing your system with respect to first three terms of the Taylor series which is usually sufficient. Okay, so, that is the motivation why you do that and uh, this is the test uh, form the signal wave form it is a constant step means there is a constant value and most of the time we, we consider that as some sort of a normalized input that means the we talk it as uh, input in input being just one unity step input and there is a ramp uh, input which again is just a t okay, with the slope uh, 1 you just keep on increasing with time. And the parabola input is something like this. You can you can associate a constant value along with this. It can be any arbitrary constant k. It can be k t. It can be k by two t square as well. Okay, so that that constant doesn't play much of a role here. So the test signals are standard forms in standard form or one t and t square by two. Okay. So with respect to these three signals, so we'll see what is the steady state errors of of our system. Okay. So, the input is let us say we talk about steady state error with respect to a, a step input then either the output can very nicely converge to that, uh, that reference input or the output can stabilize somewhere else. Okay. If it converges to that value then the steady state error is 0 okay. otherwise there is a finite value okay. E 2 of infinity for output 2 and E 1 of infinity is actually 0 here. Okay. Similar things can also happen here. Okay, so, you are talking about output 1 which nicely converges to that. So, E 1 of infinity is 0 and E 2 can have some, some finite value okay, which is and E 3 can also have a different finite value. Okay. Essentially, it can also grow. If it grows then there is the system output leads to some sort of instability. However, if it remains uh, at a finite value it is parallel to that line but it is not 0 actually. So, that is the finite error that you are talking about here. So, we, to, we want to study in which condition will lead to what and can we infer a little more about that without uh, again going to the solution and analyzing the solution as t tends to infinity that is not our motivation here. Okay. So, if how do we go using the transfer function how do you go about analyzing this uh, steady state error there are uh, two representations essentially one you can one you can think of okay, this is my closed loop transfer function already. Okay. So, this is my reference input, this is my actual output of the closed loop system. So, obviously, if I take reference input minus the actual output of the closed loop system, then that is my error. Okay, that is what I can interpret one way. 
other way to interpret is okay let me convert this uh, the entire system to a unity feedback uh, uni negative feedback uh, system okay unity negative feedback system in that sense what will happen is this e of s is essentially same r of s minus c of s okay but i'll interpret that as uh, as g of s and uh, there is a unity feedback h of s uh, equal to 1 okay this unity feedback structure has uh, has some some little more advantage in uh, in analyzing and interpreting uh, our systems uh, so we'll see that particular case in detail later we'll also see that if there is a non unity feedback system you can essentially equivalently convert it to a unity feedback system then interpret the results that way okay so that's not uh, this is not going to be too restrictive in that sense actually so if there is a unity feedback system then you can talk about e of s is nothing but r of s minus e of s however this c of s is essentially e of s uh, i mean r of s into this entire system that is the, this uh, t of s okay so we can talk about okay e of s is essentially my r of s into i mean if you if we use these two results if you put this e of s back in here and take uh, like r of s common then you can you can essentially lead to that actually okay so applying the final value theorem remember all this thing we are talking about stable system the system is unstable there is no concept of steady state error it goes in infinity anyway okay so first uh, for stable systems we can use final value theorem and e infinity turns out to be limiting limit s tends to 0 s into e of s that we know from final value theorem okay so using that we can conclude that this uh, e of infinity is actually that so some if we know the closed loop transfer function directly we can go for that actually we can actually evaluate without going for the solution part of it so is an example you can see this is the transfer function let's say then uh, unity is uh, i mean new step input then the reference i mean r of s is essentially 1 over s t of s essentially turn is is that okay so that is that and it yields to something like if you carry out this algebra e of s it turns out to be something like this so if you see this uh, pole locations and all that it will turn out to be stable stable system only one pole in the uh, on the zero i mean at zero and the other things will be in the left half side the system is stable so using the final value theorem and all that uh, you can talk about uh, as well when you talk about system being stable you don't talk about uh, e of s primarily you can even talk about t of s you can simply talk about uh, pole locations here as well now okay going back this e of s is like that so if system, uh, if t of s is stable then you can you can use the final value theorem you can just put it here okay whatever you have, you have it here because e of s is available now so carry out the algebra this s will go okay so s is, uh, this s is not there because s into e of s that's what you are talking then you let all s to be zero that, that means all these coefficients are not there so essentially results in 5 by 10 5 by 10 is essentially half so e of uh, e infinity will turn out to be half here another way of interpreting this uh, this uh, unity feedback uh, sort of idea here that e of s is essentially r of s minus c e of s okay however c of s is essentially e of s into c of s here so you can carry out okay you put put it back here and then tell e of s nothing but r of s divided by 1 plus g s actually okay the closed loop transfer function remember is g of s divided by 1 plus g of s what e of s is essentially r of s divided by 1 plus g of s okay so the way again using the final value theorem we can uh, turn e of e infinity is limit s tends to 0 s into all these actually what you have here okay so if you know this input r of s reference input r of s and the system g of s okay in a unity feedback form then essentially you can use this final value theorem this formula okay and uh, and compute a value for e infinity and uh, okay now the coming to little more analysis okay this is let's say you talk about the step input so r of s is essentially 1 by s so infinity turns out to be you just put it 1 by s here whatever here r of s is 1 by s s and r s and 1 by s will cancel out so we will be left out with this actually okay so for zero steady state error that's what we will look look forward to whether the system has really zero steady state error what will happen when this system is zero this is zero i mean when this uh, expression is zero provided this term turns out to be infinity right this will turn out to be one over infinity sort of thing actually okay so we'll look forward to some cases okay where this g of s is actually in a limiting sense when s goes to zero then this particular term leads to infinity actually 
Okay. So that means this G of S needs to be in this following structure. Okay, where this n is at least one, one or higher. Okay, so that means this particular thing s to the power n must appear. That means if you have one integral, one integrator in G of S, okay, one pole exactly sitting on the uh, on the uh, I mean one pole exactly sitting at zero, okay, at the origin, then you have steady state error zero actually. Okay. That is why integral feedback is essentially help uh, helps us in eliminating the steady state error essentially. Okay. So, if you see this, this entire term has to go to 0 that means this fellow I mean this uh, particular term has to go to infinity and this particular term will go to infinity provided it, this is in this form where s to the power n appears where n is at least 1. Okay. Right. Uh, then it is okay basically because when s tends to 0 then this entire term will go to infinity and this entire term will go to 0 basically. Okay. So, that integral feedback will help us in that sense actually. I mean integral controller essentially not that means if you have uh, some sort of a I mean if you, if this fellow does not contain any any pole at the origin then one way of doing that is probably you can just put a controller block here which is k by s actually. Okay. So, then these two will multiply and then s will appear here. Okay, so, that is that is the uh, whole idea of a PID control when we discuss a little bit later actually. Okay. So, as in a similar way you can uh, talk about ramp input as well. Okay. So, for ramp input you carry out the same exercise again. Now, you now you realize that okay, if this error has to go to 0, then this this is to still be there I mean this form, but in this particular case you need the n has to be at least 2. Okay. That means, you should have 2 poles sitting on the I mean uh, say sitting at 0 basically. So, if you, if you have a double integrator essentially then even with respect to the ramp input uh, the steady state error is going to be 0 basically. Okay. Similar thing with you parabolic input it will turn out that okay, if n is uh, at least 3 then the similar thing will also happen here. So, essentially this how many integrators you have in the forward path that uh, that that will decide whether your uh, steady state input I mean steady state error is approaching 0 or not actually. Okay. If you have no integrator obviously, you have to live with the fact that you have to have some sort of a finite error essentially and steady state actually. Well, anti integral uh, in the loop is also slightly dangerous. We will see that uh, in the PID control chapter part of it. There essentially, there that has its own problem of uh, control wind up and other things actually. So, it is not a very neat idea to put an integrator all the time actually okay. anyway. So, example sense you can uh, if you have this transfer function here g of s then h of s is 1 again then you can carry out the algebra and you can tell okay, this is my steady state error for step input this is finite value. However, when the steady state error to a step input itself is a finite value to a ramp and parabola input they will essentially go to infinity. Okay. So, and remember this uh, this ramp and parabola inputs are not really bounded inputs these are unbounded inputs when t goes to infinity the value itself goes to infinity. Okay. So, the system stable system can still be stable in that sense because the VIV sense uh, bounded input bounded output sense we have not uh, confined ourselves to bounded inputs we have put an unbounded input here. Okay. So, but steady state error sense they can still go to like infinity and things like that. Okay. There is a difference between these two actually. Now, many times it is easy convenient to de define this something called uh, position constant, velocity constant and things like that because these essentially come into picture when you when you do this analysis right. If you talk about this, these essentially dictate the steady state error actually. Okay. So, whatever terms you have here, okay, okay, these terms will essentially we will be able to uh, let us say we define these terms as some sort of like position constant and velocity constant and things like that. Then steady state error we can essentially uh, like uh, you can talk about steady state error ESS in this particular case will, will turn out to be 1 by 1 plus kp. Okay. And in this particular case this in this particular case ESS is 1 by kv like that. Okay. So, this is, uh, uh, this is this is because of that and system type is essentially the value of n by, def by definition system time is the value of n in the denominator of g of s that means, what we discussed here all over this particular value of n dictates the system's type. If it is 0, this type this system is type 0, if it is 1, type 1, if it is 2, type 2 like that actually. Okay. 
and this is a summary of the entire results I mean analysis and all that this table is there in the normal nice book anyway. So, if it is type 0, type 1, type 2 and if you have a step input, ramp input, parabola input there are nice formula like a steady state error formula is 1 by 1 plus k p, 1 by k v, 1 by k a all that that is what it just so. <laughs> then there are uh, like what is the error value essentially you can see for type 0 system this is uh, like the steady state error value type 1 it will turn out to be 0 here you know that. So, for if your system is of type 1 or type 2 then for a step input the steady state error is guaranteed to be 0. Okay. So, if your system is type 2 even for a ramp input the system um, steady state error is going to be 0, for a parabolic input it is going to be a finite value basically. So, like that. So, it is in steady state error sense it is good to have a system of type 2 okay, for studies for uh, having lesser and lesser steady state values for all sort of inputs actually. Okay. So, however, for other things it may not be desirable actually. Okay. So, we will see that. Again, uh, Okay, so, what do you infer? Let us say somebody gives us a value that k p is 1000. So, what do you infer from there? Okay. First thing is the system is stable because k p is a finite value and hence E s s is also a finite value. Okay. So, system is also stable and the system is type 0 because k p is finite. Okay. Right. If k p is finite system is to be because k p is uh, turns out to be kind of infinity for other 2. Okay. Okay. So, this is system of type 0 and you can also eventually compute infinity steady state error infinity in the using this formula it will turn out to be that value. So, all this information is embedded in k p being a number and if you know that number actually. Okay. So, you can uh, there, there are concepts called uh, disturbance input as well. Okay. So, when there is just control input uh, which is here control design sort of thing the input comes like an error between reference input and output and the disturbance input can also come to plant as some sort of a model uncertainty things like that actually. Okay. And if you have disturbance input there then it essentially the, uh, the error signal what you are coming here it can decompose you can carry out the algebra like this and you can see that E of s consists of two parts first part comes because of R of s second part comes because of D of s. Okay. So, essentially it is a combination between R and D sort of thing. So, if you really want to decrease this E of s, okay, this particularly this E d, you do not want this component build up actually coming from disturbance input. So, you want to really reduce this uh, this disturbance input effect, then you have to, to think about how to reduce this actually. Okay. Now, this particular thing I can divide numerator and denominator by G 2 of s. So, essentially it will turn out to be 1 by 1 by G 2 plus G 1. So, this particular term what I am talking here this particular term will turn if I divide by G 2 then it will turn out 1 by 1 by G 2 plus G 1. Okay. So, essentially you can reduce this by either increasing uh, G 1. Okay. If I increase this G 1 it will go to infinity or I decrease G 2 it will also go to kind of uh, infinity basically. So, this will turn this entire term will become 0. Okay. So, I can so the one way of I mean the, the mechanism here is either I talk about some sort of a high value of uh, G 1 or a low value of uh, G 2 basically okay. because G 2 normally I do not have a hand on, but I have a hand on G 1 because that is a controller that is a, that's the one I want I can design actually. So, you can increase this control increase means what I can increase the gain sort of thing until here then uh, you can have a reduced effect of the disturbance. Essentially, it, it also makes sense because if you have a high gain controller the correction becomes uh, faster. So, even if the disturbance takes you to somewhere else some other initial condition then the gain will make sure that you come back quickly sort of thing. Okay. So, that is what it is. So, finally, the how do you handle this non unity feedback system in see, because all that thing we discussed is about unity feedback system. So, if you have a non unity feedback system in general there is a block here and there is a block also here then we can do this uh, this transformation you can convert this entire system to a unity feedback system something like this actually. Okay. So, I mean you can interpret a sequence you can carry out the sequence of operations like that okay. and uh, the, and once you have once you are having here this h of s I mean this h 1 okay, and g 1 okay, first you convert it to something like this g and h. So, this h of s will contain the effect of g 1 and h 1 together. Okay. And this block diagram reduction is something that I think uh, either all of you know 
or it is easy to read in the textbook also, it is not very difficult. And this particular course is all about modern control, so I will not about talk about too much details about that. So, if there is a block so like something here, it, it is possible to reduce something like that, but still it is not unity. So, what you do, you add one, add one and subtract one. Now, it will become a parallel loop from here these three and we know that parallel things you can add up and uh, serial things you the multiplication, that is the rule actually. So, if there is a parallel thing, I can I can add these two basically, okay. so it turn out to be HS minus 1. Okay. Then I will dump these two okay. and this will go something like this. Now, it uh, operates in some sort of a unity feedback sense. So, all the things that I have discussed in unity feedback sense uh, is still valid even if there is a general system actually. So, that is the that is the way to approach actually. Now, finally, there is another concept something called sensitivity and uh, this is essentially the degree to which changes in the system parameter affect the system transfer function and hence the system performance actually that is called sensitivity. So, greater the sensitivity less desirable is the effect of parameter change. So, this is uh, even mathematically something like this sensitivity of f with respect to p that uh, this is like uh, if you take limit delta p tends to 0 that is the fractional change in the, in the function f divided by fractional change in the parameter p. So, that is the fractional change in function f divided by fractional change in parameter p and then you can carry out this algebra it turns out to be something like this p by f partial differential of uh, f with respect to p. Example if you have something like this and there is a let us consider a ramp input there is a kv is something like that e infinity is like this okay, e infinity is 1 by kv anyway. Okay, so, that is like that. Now, it turns out okay, what is the sensitivity of this E with respect to A and what is the sensitivity of this E with respect to K and we have the formula. If E with respect to A is A by E this partial derivative and E with respect to K is K by E this partial derivative. So, you can see that actually. Okay. So, 1 is plus 1 this is minus 1 so, that means if I have some change in parameter A E is going to increase actually. So, if I have a positive increase in A, E is going to increase. If in other words, if I increase A, E infinity is going to increase. If I increase K, E infinity is going to decrease because the sensitivity is minus 1 here, which is very clear from here. So, that is how we carry out the analysis uh, uh, in sensitivity sense. That is all for this lecture and further things we will continue in the next one. Thank you.